Hello everyone, welcome to this unique and exclusive Q&A with Annika Sörenstam. I'm Anders Kallén, CEO at Golf More, and here with me I have my Golf More colleague. Hi, my name is Denise, I'm e-commerce coordinator at Golf More. And also with us today we have none other than the 72 times LPGA winner, Miss 59 and Hall of Famer Annika Sörenstam. Hi Annika, how are you? I am fine. How are you? Thank you very much for having me. Great, thank you. Uh, this webinar is a part of our collaboration with Annika Invitational Europe. And this is the second year that we do this Q&A session. We're really proud and excited to have a chance to talk to you, Annika, and also to invite many golfers and golf clubs across the world to listen in. We spoke almost exactly one year ago, and much has happened since then. How has your year been, Annika? <laughs> it's been good. Thanks for asking. I've, I've been busy um, with family and golf and definitely the foundation and all the other businesses, but it's all good. You know, time flies. I can't believe it's been a year, but um, it's been a good one looking back and thinking about the places I've been, the people we met and kind of the memories we created. Um, so, Govamore is a proud main partner uh, to Annika Invitational Europe. And just like you, Annika, we are very passionate about junior golf and how to help them develop their games. Um, Annika, you started Annika Invitational Europe in 2012, now almost a decade ago. Are you pleased with the development so far? I would definitely so, um, say that. It's uh, ama amazing how time flies. But yeah, we've done a lot of things in the last you know, 10, 12, actually 15 years since the Annika Foundation started, you know, we've been able to influence a lot of young girls around the world. And uh, of course, Annika Invitational Europe is, is something that we're super proud of, you know, being from Sweden and, and grown up in the Swedish national team and, and all the things we've done there. And just to kind of see, you know, look at the success of Swedish golfers, especially young girls, um, I would say that, you know, started with Annika Cup and then Annika Invitational. And now we're seeing them you know, entering the professional world and, and how well they're doing and whether they're representing, you know, Sweden or Europe and Soham Cup and, but, you know, the success and the, you know, the quality of the players is amazing. Yeah. Um, where do you see Annika Invitational Europe in 10 years from now? Um, I mean, how do you see it develop further? Well, I mean, we're going to continue to do what we're doing. We, you know, the more girls we can somehow be involved with around the world is really what we're trying to do. You know, Sweden has a, been a great location to host the best European players. I mean, our goal is obviously to provide an amazing golf tournament, but, you know, our slogan is more than golf. So, you know, what does that mean? Well, we do seminars, whether it's, you know, talking about college golf or whether we're talking about nutrition, fitness, social media, there's a lot of things that we talk about to make these girls realize that it's more than golf. It's more than just hitting a seven iron. Um, and so, you know, to make a quality tournament by having a great venue, great food, great competition. I mean, everything we try to do to make it just better for these young girls, we want them to feel very special. And um, yeah, that's kind of our goal. In the end of 2020, you were elected chairman of International Golf Federation. Um, how do you see that you can use this position to lift girls junior golf? Well, I mean, it's um, obviously a, a very um, honorable position to have, and I feel, you know, honored to have been asked to do this. I mean, we focus a lot on the, you know, obviously the youth around the world, whether it's, you know, team events and whether it's, you know, the Olympics and so forth. But I think, you know, having the growth as kind of the most important factor, how do we grow the game? How do we expand this game and how do we get more people participating or involved or just, you know, enjoying the game at different levels. So, you know, it's obviously getting all the different foundations involved from all around the world and listening and learning and then providing. So, no, it's been an interesting process and, you know, taking my knowledge from my own playing career and, and try to assist, you know, wherever I can is, uh, it's been fun. Great. Last year, Annika Invitational Europe was uh, hosted in Skåne, Vasa Torp Golf Club. And this year we're going to be at Halmstad Golf Club. What are your expectations for the tournament this year? Well, I mean, we're lucky. We've been to some really good places <laughs> throughout the years. You know, many clubs have opened up, you know, the golf courses, you know, the club 
houses, their facilities, and the memberships have been very welcome. You know, they want to be part of this uh, this growth. They want to be part of the event, and you know, we uh, we bring uh, quite a bit of not just enjoyment, but you know, to the different communities. We like to get people involved and support and help and. And of course, I think it's important for a club to host junior golf tournaments because it's part of the development, right? It's part of the duty to be part of a club and be able to help the next generation of, of young girls. But I also feel like it's, you know, young girls at different clubs, they, you know, if a club hosts a tournament, you, you can see kind of how these young girls start dreaming about the possibility of being part of it. So, you know, going from, you know, going from Vossathorpe last year to Hunstad this year is, you know, it, again, you know, lucky to go from one great place to another. You know, Hamster has done a really good job in the past. We've been there several times. They keep showing interest. As you know, it's a beautiful part of, of Sweden. Uh, the the venue, the clubhouse, the golf course has everything that we possibly can ask for. So I think that's also makes the tournament, you know, it elevates the tournament because people go, wow, that's a great place and a great golf course. And we know it's a fair setup. And, and I think that the young girls really look forward to playing. Great. We like Halmstad as well. <laughs> we have a fantastic group of golfers right now, uh, Swedish golfers, Lin Grant, Maja Stark and Ingrid Lindblad at the foremost, making big waves in the golf uh, world right now. First and foremost, how do you think this f the future looks like for the Swedish golfers? Well, you're right. We have some really good players right there in the pipeline. And I saw just Ingrid two days ago and obviously keep a, a close eye on Lin and and Maya Stark, um, you know, I just want to, you know, give a shout out to uh, Lynn Grant, who played so well last year in the Scandinavian mix, because it's coming up, literally, I mean, it was a year ago when, when she um, just ran away from the field. Uh, it was a fantastic win for her. And then since that, I mean, that gave her a lot of confidence and she has done very well on the Ladies European Tour, winning several tournaments. So, yeah, I think it's, it's really inspiring. Uh, it's great to see that the hard work from everybody is paying off, from the player, from the coaches, to the families, to the, you know, the federation. Everybody has been involved one way or another. Uh, you know, everybody loves to see a little success and feel that the hard work is is paying off. So as far as the future goes, I think, you know, it always kind of goes in cycles a little bit up and down. But right now, I think we're seeing really good, good uh, potential. And when you watch the Nanak Invitational, whether it's in Europe or USA or Argentina, you're really going to see the next generation of superstars. I mean, these are incredible young ladies. They're great ambassadors for the game. Um, they're influencers in their own area. And they just, what they stand for and how they act and how they, you know, just being out there. I mean, they just, it's, it's so terrific to, you know, to work with them because it makes you proud that <clears throat> golf is really creating these nice individuals that have, you know, a, a strong shoulder, a strong head on their shoulders. Yeah, I, I can really see that. And uh, do you think that this, I will call them, upcoming generation will have a same and similar leading position in the world of golf as you, Karin Koch, uh, Sofie Gustafsson, Mimi Hjort, Helene Alfredsson, Katrin Nilsbark and many others had during the early years? Yeah, why not? <laughs> I think uh, Sweden has made a good mark when it comes to golf on the golf map. You know, we have good reputation around the world. And um, these young girls are obviously following some of those footsteps, but they have the opportunity to take it over, you know, to be the next generation and, and lead us uh, towards whatever is coming next, right? Um, it's really nice to see. Um, so, you know, Swedish golf is in good hands and tournaments like Anik Invitational Europe is, you know, these are the events that we need uh, to just kind of develop these young players and uh, but also I think you know having a responsibility having a place uh, you know having a table so to speak in the golf world and, and make this happen is, is so important you know and I think Sweden does a pretty good job in that you know playing their role the big role in this uh, part of, of the growth. Thank you. You were a very tight group of Swedes in the early 2000s and you all achieved great success together both individually but also in the Solheim Cup context, so to speak. From a group perspective and from your analysis, uh, why do you think that this Swedish group from the early 2000s was so successful? And what advice would you give this upcoming Swedish group to achieve similar success as you had? 
Well, um, good question. I don't really have the answer to that, but I do know things go in cycles. It's almost like if somebody does well, it, it feeds success to others, you know, confidence or motivation or inspiration, all those things kind of go together. Uh, we were a good generation right there for, for a little while, and it was fun. We had a lot of friends that did, you know, we played together, we traveled together, especially in the national team, and then we, you know, we shared the tour together too. So, yeah, I really enjoyed those times, and I think uh, we made Sweden proud uh, as far as golf goes. And, you know, we're seeing it now with these some of the <coughs> names that you mentioned, and uh, there's no doubt in my mind that they will be on the Soham Cup, and they will build their own legacy, and uh, but we have to continue to work, right? I mean, it doesn't end because you get them there. It continues to work. I think the hardest part is actually maintaining that high level. Uh, it's not about necessarily getting there. It's how you stay there. I think that's probably the hardest part. So, uh, but I'm proud. I'm, you know, be looking forward to seeing this more Swedes into the, into the Soham Cups and the World Cups, and hopefully we can get, um, you know, a Swedish win and an. LPJ major. I know we have a few players. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm playing with Madeleine Sockstrom in, in about an hour. So <laughs> she is uh, an upcoming, probably the best player right now <coughs> on the LPGA. And so I would love to see her do, do well. Um, you said it yourself, Annika. Um, I mean, it's not only Sweden who is improving. Uh, many other countries are also improving uh, very quickly. Um, where do you see the primary development for young um, girls in golf? Um, and is there any country or continent that um, where the competition has increased the last years? Well, yeah, you're right. I mean, there's lots of countries that are spending a lot of effort and money and resources on on golfers. Um, you know, I actually think Spain is doing a really good job. Uh, we're now seeing them hosting the Soham Cup for the first time, but they really had several instrumental players from Spain. We see them always supporting the Annika Invitational around the world. And so that's one country that I'm, you know, seeing a lot more uh, support. I'm in the U.S., of course. They always have good players. We're also starting to see some players in South America. Uh, you know, there are other sports that are a lot bigger, soccer, to name one of them. But golf is really starting to um, get some recognition and some exposure and a lot more awareness. I do think the Olympics had a lot to do with that. Um, but yeah, it's a global game, but there's certain countries you see, I mean, Thailand and is another one, a very small country that's just producing some amazing players. And, you know, the work really started probably 15, 10 years ago, right? So it's not, you know, just something now. Um, it takes time to create these uh, superstars, but you know, I think we can all learn for what they're all doing. I mean, at one point, a lot of federations were looking at Sweden. You know, what are the Swedes doing? How, how come they're doing so well on the different tours and so forth? So I think right now that, you know, it's changing a little bit, but not necessarily a bad thing. I think we can all learn from what everybody else um, adds to the game. Yeah. Um, besides making sure that the children are having fun at the golf course, um, how should a parent act if they have a child who aims to become a golf professional one day? I mean, um, in many sports where the child is successful, some parents are very driven, some others are more in the background. Um, how do you think successful golf play parents handle their children and their development in golf? Well... <laughs> I would say we see everything from from extraordinary involved to very little involvement. Um, you know, every child is very different. We all have different parenting styles, right? Uh, being a mom, I, I kind of know what, what my husband and I do with our children. Uh, but I think just in general, I mean, it, I think it, the parent's role is to encourage, support, love, um, and give the resources to any child, whatever they want to do. The same thing for golf. And but you do have to make sure that the players do a lot on their own. You know, that's how they learn. Sport is a great, great way to grow up, to mature, to learn lessons, take responsibilities and be responsible and be accountable. All these things is, is what makes sports so great. And golf is no different. So, you know, any parent that's listening here, it's, you know, we all really appreciate the support and everything. Uh, but let your child experience, you know, let the child make decisions and, you know, learn the consequences. That's how they get stronger. That's how they get better. So there's a fine line of, of helping and, and not hurting. So, uh, but you see all kinds, uh, as I'm sure you know, uh, from, 
you know, from every aspect of the game. Great. Every year we actually give out the Driving Force Award to a person who is doing that little extra for junior golfers, especially girls. And uh, the last year actually the winner was from your home club. Uh, it's the Swedish home club, I would say. What do you recommend a junior coach to think about when it comes to motivate, inspire and develop junior golfers? Yeah, first of all, I think it's great what you guys do um, to celebrate good coaches. You can't have too many of those. <laughs> you need good influencers. You need good people. Uh, and there are so many out there that just put so many hours in. They work all the time and, you know, they're just not selfish. They think of others. They always make sure that other people get what they need. And, you know, they work odd hours left and right. So thank you for doing that. I think, you know, as a coach out there, it's Obviously, it's important to have a good grip and hit the ball well and make putts, et cetera. But I think a coach at a club is, should really focus more on the individual and making sure that these um, juniors are becoming good individuals and not just focus on the golf. Sometimes I think we all get so caught up in the results and scores and performances. And when in today's world, I think it's important to be, you know, be a good person and then you play golf or other, you know, be a golfer and then trying to make you as a person. So, you know, a lot of good coaches out there, you know, put the human being first and then the golfer second. So help them develop as people, you know, teach them the values and the morals and the respect and the tradition. Um, and then sprinkle in, you know, the golf fundamentals and golf etiquette and all those things that comes with it. And I think, you know, that's, that's important too. So it's not easy being a coach because it has, it's a big role, right? It's an important role. Many of these coaches spend a lot of time with juniors and, you know, some of it could be a little bit of a parenting. So it's a fine line of stepping in where you maybe shouldn't, but also make sure that these kids are having fun and doing what they enjoy and develop as people uh, and not be, you know, so focused on the performance. Thank you. I can completely agree with that. And what do you think is missing or could actually be improved uh, in junior activities at clubs to attract more juniors to, to the sport of golf, especially girls? Yeah. Well, again, I mean, we have clubs that are very, very invested and so engaged and so involved and they have lots of juniors. And, and then you have some clubs that really don't have anything, right? That's not important to the club. It, they really don't make a big deal. Or they don't try to invite kids. So, you know, I think it literally starts at the club level and, you know, who is running the club and what's important to the membership. And, you know, I would love to say that we have to think about the future of the game. And golf is a, is a sport that you can play all your life. So we need to have diversity in our memberships. We need to have young people in there and, and help them foster uh, and think about the future. So, you know, have a good mix. It's really good. I mean, I grew up at a club where we had probably a third of the membership were juniors, and but we all mingled and we all got along with everybody. And then, you know, suddenly 10 years go by and you realize that now the juniors are kind of the main part of the club, right? They're now in their 20s and now they're paying members and, you know, you, you have that membership um, shift. So I think it's important to have that. And so a club, you know, that's out there and really feel like they should play a bigger part in, in the growth of the game. I mean, reach out to clubs that do that do well, that have, you know, the leaders that's needed, you know, go out there and ask for some advice. What what events can we do? What initiatives can we do? And what's, what's family friendly? Um, I know there's a lot of clubs that would be, you know, really willing to share the successes <clears throat> they're having. And I think that's important. Learn from others and, you know, don't be shy and, and feel like, wow, we should maybe know this and we don't. But I know that um, you guys have a lot of contacts and it would be great if, you know, use clubs to mentor other clubs. Uh, you know, some of them have great resources, but, you know, don't have, you know, your resources be a factor to hold you back. I mean, you can still have, you know, the human resources and have fun programs, you know, have little summer camps or, you know, junior, junior training a few times a week and engage other members, other kids to help other juniors. I mean, I remember when I started to play at the age of 12, you know, I didn't get the head pro as my teacher. I had juniors as my teacher, other juniors that were 16 to 18. And that was kind of their way of paying forward, you know, giving back. And, and that's how we built friendships too. So all of a sudden I was part of kind of the junior activities. I got taught by them. And then when I reached a certain level, I now was instructed by the pros and then I had to give back. 
so I think that philosophy works quite well. Great, thank you. Fantastic answer. Uh, talking about the future, uh, actually this is a rather long question, so I will read it. Uh, the ball discussion has flared up again and the governing bodies in golf wants to see all professional golfers play with the same type of golf ball. One of these reasons is to defend and protect the courses from just being or becoming drive wedge courses for the long hitting pros that uh, since this new ball then would travel shorter than today's golf ball. Many are against this proposal, but there are also at the same time uh, people that really support it, among others Rory McIlroy. He argues that with a ball that travels shorter, pros will force, oh, they will be forced to use all clubs in the bag during a round. And this will benefit the pros who are more complete in their game. How do you think uh, this sounds? Um, yeah, I, um, I happen to agree with Rory on this matter. Um, I do think that even if you're a long hitter and we, you know, we make sure the ball goes shorter, I still think the long hitter will still be the longest. Um, as long as we make sure that strength and distance is still part of the game, uh, I think I am, I'm not against um, changing the ball. I know that many don't like it. I mean, certainly not manufacturing <laughs> likes it. Um, but we do have to protect the golf courses. We do have to protect the game in one way. Um, you know, there's a part of me that always felt really good about golf is that anybody can play any ball that any professional can. You know, we had professional rules and amateur rules were the same in that sense. And I, and I always thought that was a great thing, right? It's great to be able to play a ball that a professional uses. But I think it's also come to a point where we need to start addressing this and uh, but I just want to make sure, again, you know, to highlight that if you're a long hitter, you should not lose that advantage. Um, you should still be able to hit it a long ways with these other balls. But I do agree with Rory that it puts a little premium on the rest of the game. And, and that's really what this game is about. It shouldn't just be about power. Um, I think accuracy, I think strategy, I think planning, all those things matter. I mean, just look at the recent PGA Championship. Uh, that was done. That course was set up very, very well. Uh, it was not so much about power because you can tell some of these players, um, you know, it's about maneuvering the golf course and having good distance control. And I think that to me is, is we kind of lost that a little bit. Uh, and maybe toning down the ball would help getting back on that track again. Um, there are many superlatives to de describe your career and your success. I mean, nothing really went wrong there. Um, but if you were to go back to your junior days and give yourself advice now that you can look back on things, what would that be? Well, I'm sure I can. Uh, I learned a lot throughout the years, but thank you. Um, you know, I think I've always been somebody who I don't really look back. I try to look forward. I like to learn from my mistakes. And um, I think mistakes is really what forms us, you know, that paves the path for, for the future. And, and uh, I think if you don't make any mistakes, well, first of all, there's something wrong with that. Everybody does something. But if you don't do them again, I think those are the, the greatest lessons. Uh, but, you know, having said that, I mean, I think, you know, the key really is to, you know, during my early years, it was, you know, I don't mind being focused and disciplined and all of those things, but you know, everything was just going 100 miles an hour. You know, I never really looked back in the sense to reflect and, and give myself a little credit. And um, it almost felt like, yeah, that was great, but I can do this and this. And then it was like, well, great win. Yeah, but I could have done this and this. And it was, that's the fine line when you're extremely competitive, like I am always trying to improve and always trying to be better. That sometimes, you know, I don't sit back and, and smell the roses, you know, the expression of this kind of, you know, giving yourself a little break and, and appreciate the successes. So that's maybe something that I could have done a little better is to just, um, you know, tell myself good work and let it soak it in rather than, okay, what's next? <clears throat> it's always on the go, always pushing, always trying to get better. So it's a fine line because if I didn't do that, I guess, then maybe I wouldn't have reached the heights that I did. 
Yeah, true. Uh, I totally agree with you. Um, with your experience and when you look back on your career, once again, um, what is the biggest golf myth uh, that juniors may believe in and that may hinder their understanding and development um, of the game? I mean, for example, a myth can be that you have to hit long in order to be a golf professional or that you always have to hit perfect shots to, to win a tournament. Yeah, I think you just said it right there. <laughs> Everybody thinks they have to hit perfect shots all day long. You know, if you shoot 70, it doesn't mean you have 70 good shots. I mean, I would say that maybe half of them were, were you know, pretty good. And then maybe a handful were just really, really good. Um, you know, golf is, is more a game about how good your misses are. Because we're all going to miss. So make sure your misses are better than others. Uh, but I think that's, you know, something that... People think there has to be a perfect swing. It has to look perfect, and you have to do that. You know, I think game the game of golf in tournaments is a lot about scrambling, you know, getting the ball in the hole. And, you know, it's fine when you're practicing and you want to improve and everything, but when you get in a tournament, it's a lot different. You know, we always say it's it's a scorecard, not a postcard. So you just get it's all about the numbers you get in, and then you can always work on your game later. But I think a lot of people try to just be so perfect from first tee to the 18th green and it's very difficult to live up to that uh, I think another one is you know that you have every single tournament has to be perfect right I mean not many sports where it's like golf when if you win once or twice a year you're having a great season um, I was lucky to do that a few times and more but you know I think it's so it's open a lot of players can do well and so you know focus more on the consistency than just kind of the highs and the lows. Uh, another one I think for a lot of upcoming players is they want to rush out there. They want to be, you know, the youngest to do this, so they want to do that. And you don't have to be first and everything. You know, it's more about the consistency and and the, you know keep thinking of a of your tournament um, career as maybe as a journey where you know it takes time to get there and it's one step at a time. You don't just go from zero to 10 in just a really quick time. Um, you have to build patience and, you know, whether you're building strength or distance and short game, all those, all these different pieces um, has to kind of come together and it just doesn't happen overnight. So, um, you know, people that have a longer career, you know, do better than somebody's trying to go out there for a short period of time and kind of come out with an explosion or a bang. <laughs> Yeah. Um, here's a very interesting question. Um, if you got the chance to go back in time and re-hit one specific shot, which shot would that be and why? Yeah, I do have one in mind a long time ago. It was on the 36th hole in US Amateur, the final on the 18th hole there. Uh, it was a par four and we were all tied. Vicky Getz, she was the number one amateur player at the time. We've had some head-to-head -head duels in our amateur careers and and like I said we came down to the very last hole in a 36 hole uh, match play and I my second shot was had a six iron and I and I swung way 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 too fast hit a little thin and it went to to the right and ended up in the in a water hazard and I ended up dropping and making bogey and she made par and she won and you know I just Again, I mean, I'm, I'm super excited about my career and happy and all of that. So you can think of that shot really doesn't matter that much. But, you know, when you think of things you wish you could have done better, that's one of them. I mean, I, yeah, I've hit a few shots. You know, I had a chance to win a U.S. Open in Pumpkin Ridge in Oregon. Par five, I'm going for the green. I hit it to the right. I ended up making, I think it was par or bogey. Um, if I would have... Uh, made birdie I would have won it outright so if I could just re-hit that one that would be nice too but I am going to tell you if I hit a lot of shots from where I've been lucky to uh where I've been on the other side of of that and have won tournaments so kind of goes back to to an answer I had earlier what you know what are you learning from your career and I would say that uh you know we all make mistakes just learn from it so it's just part of the game <laughs> well Thank you. Uh, thank you, Annika, for all the great uh, answers to our questions. We will actually round up this uh, Q&A session with a game that we call all over the place. We say five statements and if a statement is right, then you say four right. 
And if the statement is not correct, you say for left. Are you okay. with us with that? Great. I think so. <laughs> Great. <laughs> then I start out with number one. Uh, my favorite shot is a high draw. For right. For right. Number two. I still get angry when I miss a short putt. <laughs> for right. Great. Number three. My favorite club in the bag is the driver. Mm, for left. Interesting. Number four. I love to wake up before 6 a.m. every morning. Uh, <laughs> I think that's just four. <laughs> <laughs> Weekdays, weekends. Uh, yeah, exactly. So if I have a pick one, I guess four left because I don't do it every day, but I do it many days. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the last question in this uh, all over the place competition. The water in Poppy's Pond at Mission Hills is quite gross. Uh, four left. I don't mind. If you go in there when you win, I don't care what it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much for the answers to this all over the place uh, Q&A. And uh, also thank you for everyone listening in to this session. Thank you Annika and bye from us from Sweden.